We and the opposition will judge the government's legislative programme against three tests. Will it deliver a more equal society, an economy that works for everyone, and a society in which there is opportunity for all? Sadly, it appears that many of the proposals in the Queen's speech militate against those aims, as have the proposals in previous years. Still, this government does not seem to understand that cuts have their consequences. When you cut adult social care, it has an impact on National Health Service accident emergency departments. When you saddle young people with more debt, you impede their ability to buy a home or start a family. When you fail to build housing and cap housing benefit, then homelessness and the number of families in temporary accommodation increases. When you slash the budgets of local authorities, then leisure centres close, libraries close, children's centres close. When you close fire stations and cut firefighters' jobs, then response times increase and more people are in danger of dying in fires. This austerity is a political choice, not an economic necessity. And it's a wrong choice for our country and made by a government with the wrong priorities. And it's women that have been hit hardest by these cuts. Over 80% of cuts fall disproportionately on women. And as the Women's Budget point Group has pointed out, all these cuts mean that the opportunities for women are systematically reduced and diminished within our society. This government is failing to deliver an economy that meets the needs and aspirations of the people that sent us here. A government that is consistently failing to meet its own economic targets. They failed on the deficit, failed on the debt, failed on productivity, failed to rebalance the economy. Once again, the Northern Powerhouse was announced. Announced yet again. If only the rhetoric matched the reality. We discovered in March that the Northern Powerhouse has 97% of its senior staff based here in London. A Northern Powerhouse outsourced to the capital. For all the Chancellor's rhetoric, there has been systematic underinvestment in the North. Only 1%, 1% of the government's infrastructure pipeline are currently in construction in the North East. Much could be said. Much could be said in a similar vein on housing. The government claims to aspire to build a, nil, a million new homes. The reality, however, is that house building has sunk to its lowest level since the 1920s. And so out of touch are the benches opposite. They think £450,000 is what people can afford for a starter home. And the announcement again today of Britain's digital infrastructure is welcome. Perhaps, and I hope it does, this time it will become a reality. Perhaps the Chancellor, who sadly is not here today, is a convert to our fiscal rule, a rational rule backed by leading economists which allows for borrowing on capital spending. I point out to the Prime Minister whether on the Northern Powerhouse building homes or investing in digital infrastructure, simply saying things does not make them happen. It takes commitment to, make, to fund them. Mr Speaker, this government is failing to deliver even on its own proposals, though often that is for the better. The Prime Minister said two weeks ago, we're going to have academies for all, and it will be in the Queen's speech. But just a fortnight later, there is no sign of it. Parents, governors, pupils, teachers and head teachers will be relieved to get final confirmation today that the wrong-headed proposals, the wrong-headed proposals to impose forced academisation have finally been dumped. They've been forced to back down, Mr Speaker on a number of issues in recent months. On tax credits, on the Saudi prison deal, on police cuts, on cuts to personal independence payments for disabled people, on the solar tax, on the tampon tax, on freedom of information, on Sunday training and on aspects of the trade union bill and the housing bill. To call it disarray would be generous, but that's without discussing the resultant black hole in the government's finances. But 
Perhaps, but perhaps, Mr. Speaker, most worrying proposal of all is the decision to try to seek to redefine poverty and deprivation. Apparently, it's all about instability, addiction, and debt. All things you can blame on individuals about which governments like to moralise. Well, no. Well, no, Mr. Speaker. It's about one million people in our country using food banks, about record levels of in-work poverty. The fact that absolute child poverty after housing costs is up by half a million. That poverty is up in disabled households on the same basis. That homelessness has gone up every year since the Prime Minister took office. And that last Christmas, Mr Speaker, 100,000 children spent that festival in temporary insecure accommodation. And the causes of this, cuts to welfare benefits, cuts to ESA, the bedroom tax, the benefit cap, wages being too low and jobs insecure and housing, whether to rent or buy, being too expensive. Mr Speaker, you don't tackle poverty by moving the goalposts. Poverty and inequality are collective failures of our society as a whole, not individual ones. On current form, on current form, on current form, Mr. Speaker, much of what Her Majesty announced today will not require her signature. Will not require her signature, and I very much hope the government's proposals today to consign into ever deeper debt those seeking to learn will be rejected. I hope, Mr. Speaker, there will be a cross-party consensus on one element of the government's proposals. The Honourable Member of All should understand what I'm about to say. That's the proposal to repeal the Human Rights Act, brought in at the very start of the last Labour government, has brought the European Convention on Human Rights into British law and thus empowering British citizens and giving rights to everybody in our society. We will defend our Human Rights Act as we defend the human rights of everyone in this country and indeed all those that benefit from the European Convention on Human Rights. I understand, and it's quite bizarre, that the Home Secretary is the driving force behind tearing up the Human Rights Act and leaving the Convention, which is strange as she has very strong European credentials. What it shows, Mr Speaker, is whether you're actually in or out of the EU, the main obstacle holding back the people of this country is not the EU, but that Conservative government. A Conservative government that is displaying a very worrying authoritarian streak. The primacy of this House, of the House of Commons, is not in doubt. We are committed to replacing the House of Lords with a democratic chamber. But we will scrutinise sceptically any proposals that seek to weaken the ability to hold the government to account as the other place rightly does. Democracy, Mr Speaker, requires accountability for decisions that are made. The National Health Service is in record deficit. Yet there's no legislation in the Queen's speech to improve our National Health Service. Perhaps the Prime Minister can belatedly adopt the central medical pr principle, first, do no harm. But unfortunately, there is legislation pending which will affect the NHS. The decision last year to cut nurses' bursaries. Can the Prime Minister confirm that this decision will be put to the House and voted on in this chamber? It is opposed by all the unions involved in the NHS and the Royal, Colle and the Royal Colleges representing nurses and midwives. The move to dissuade people from taking up nursing is all the more bizarre, Mr Speaker, coming as it does at a time when the government is planning to train nurses to take on more responsibilities from doctors. We welcome the government's uh, proposals to support driverless cars in our society, but can they address 
a Secretary of State who appears to be asleep at the wheel in her control, his control of the NHS. Mr Speaker, we have made it clear before that with regard to the sugar tax we will look favourably on proposals to tackle childhood obesity. We welcome the Government's U-turn on forced academisation. As with schools, we would like to see as with schools, as with schools, we'd like to see. Mr. Speaker, I will continue with my speech if I may. As with schools, we'd like to see all ministers being good or even outstanding, but they need the freedom to listen to the public and the people who understand services best. So we look forward to scrutinising the surviving proposals in the Government's Education Bill to ensure they are better thought through. Just as we have opposed the increase in unqualified teachers in our classrooms, we hope that the Government will get to grips with the £800 million being spent annually on supply teachers because of the recruitment and retention crisis in schools. With school budgets scheduled, Mr Speaker, we just agreed to behave with civility in this chamber. Some members opposite have very short memories. Order. Point of order, Mr Jacob Rees-Mogg. Point of order, Mr Speaker. Am I not right in thinking that it is a customary courtesy within this House for people, though they do not have to, to give way in speeches that last over 20 minutes? The essence of the Honourable Gentleman's point was encapsulated in that first sentence. Customary, but it is not required. There is no obligation. Members may want the Right Honourable Gentleman to give way, but he's not obliged to do so. And I gently say to the Honourable Member for Winchester and to the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Sherwood, that they can have a go, but if the Right Honourable Gentleman doesn't want to give way, they will not advance their cause by shouting, and that in itself is uncivil, something of which the Honourable Gentleman, the Member for North East Somerset, is never guilty. Mr Jeremy Corbyn. Go on, Jeremy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. School budgets are scheduled to receive their biggest real terms cut since the 1970s. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, education is actually quite important in our society. The Government can therefore ill afford to be sending, spending so much on supply teachers. We have to move away from Agency Britain. So we will look at the proposals for a national funding formula that would encourage the Government to look, for example, at the school meals and breakfast policies that have been introduced in Labour Wales, which help young people in Wales. Mr Speaker, we welcome moves, we welcome moves to speed up adoption. That is in the interests of both children and those families committed to adoption. But the priority has to always be the welfare and safety of the child. But, Mr Speaker, at a time when social services and children's services are being slashed, we have to ask whether the funding will match the desire. We should also put, and all of us can I'm sure agree on this, our record and thanks to all those families that do foster, do adopt and do give children the very best lives that they possibly can. They are heroes within our society. Students today are more in debt than ever. And I want to make it clear to the Prime Minister, he will not get any support from these benches on raising tuition fees. This Government is penalising students, announcing the abolition of maintenance grants last year and now announcing that fees will be raised even further. This is a tax on learning, as the Chancellor Exchequer called it in 2003, from a Government that cuts taxes on capital gains. What message does that send? about the economy they want to create. That wealth generates more wealth with minimal tax, that effort and hard work lands you in a lifetime of debt with no support while you're making that effort. What an insult 
to the aspirations of young people wanting an education. We are deeply concerned about the implications for a free market, free for all, in higher education. Mr Speaker, the Government has committed to more apprenticeships. We welcome that if it means more high quality apprenticeships. Also, that those apprenticeships equally inspire young women to become engineers as young men to become carers. It gives opportunities for every young person in our society. But they should not be seen by any employer as a means of circumventing paying a decent wage while offering little training. We all hear far too many cases of that. We will scrutinise carefully proposals to give prison governors more freedom. It seems the policies of this government have been to give greater freedoms to prisoners, that is, the consequences of overcrowding prisons and cutting one third of dis dedicated prison officer positions. We welcome the proposals to give greater time for education and reform and to reduce reoffending rates. When I was a member of the Justice Select Committee, I visited, I visited young offender institutions in Denmark and in Norway. Their approach, Mr Speaker, works. The prison crisis is one that does not require laughter to solve its problems. The approach they've adopted, they've approached they've adopted in those two Scandinavian countries does require more funding and more staff, but it does have a very good effect on reoffending rates. There is equally a very urgent need to invest in the care of prisoners who suffer from mental health conditions. The alarming rise in prison suicides in recent years means that two prisoners every week are taking their own lives in our prisons. That is a truly horrifying statistic, it is only part of the disarray in our prisons. Emergency services were called out. Mr Speaker, emergency services were called out 26,600 times in, or over 20 minutes on average to incidents in UK prisons last year. The tide of violent attacks in prisons is rising and has to be addressed. That is our responsibility in this House to do so. Many more of our public services are under threat. No. Many more of our public services are under threat. The land registry is threatened with privatisation. A move considered and then rejected in the last two parliaments. Those governments listened to the concerns of public and expert opinion. I hope and trust this government will consult and come to the same conclusion. Rather than selling off the family silver, it will retain the land registry in public ownership and public administration. We are very clear. We are very clear that the BBC is a valued national institution. But its success is an anathema to this ideological government. Labour will continue to stand up for the licence fee payer and will fight any further government attacks on the BBC and its independence. Whether it's the National Health Service, good and outstanding schools, the East Coast Main Line in public operation or the BBC, the government just can't stand the threat of a good example of popular, successful public services. We will stand up for them against what this government is doing. On this side of the House, we have, a long, we have long highlighted the injustice of the unequal funding allocation to local authorities. I hope the government's finance bill will be an opportunity to address the disgraceful situation in which the poorest areas, mainly in the inner cities in this country, suffer by far the greatest cuts in their expenditure. The cuts imposed on local authorities have a devastating impact of services for both young and old. Just this week, 
Oxfordshire Council, the Prime Minister's favourite county council, despite the protestations of some local residents, announced it was closing half of its children's centres. In the past five years, £4.5 billion has been cut from the adult social care budget, taking away dignity from elderly and disabled people. Again, Mr Speaker, those massive cuts in the adult social care budget mean the effects of them fall disproportionately on women in our society. We will scrutinise very carefully the devolution of business rates, which, if not handled correctly, has the potential to exacerbate inequalities between areas of this country. We have a deeply unbalanced economy, and we will oppose plans that widen regional inequalities rather than narrow them. On a positive note, Mr Speaker, we do wholeheartedly, we do wholeheartedly welcome moves to devolve powers to re-regulate the bus service. We will look to expand those provisions more widely. There are whole areas of the country, particularly in rural Britain, that have no bus services at all and they should be provided with them, particularly those obviously that don't have access to their own cars to move about. We are very sceptical, Mr Speaker, about competition in the water industry. It actually goes against much of the trend of the rest of Europe for remunicipalisation of water giving water back to communities. A government committed to devolution might consider that. But, Mr Speaker, they want competition. Perhaps we can have uh, competition in reservoirs, pumping stations and mains pipes. You could even have three standpipes at every corner. Imagine the vision of Tory Britain. One for Evian, one for Perrier and one for Malvern Water. Mr Speaker, no, I won't give way. Mr Speaker, we have no objection. Mr Speaker. Order. I'm well aware that there are members who want to intervene, and that's perfectly reasonable of them to want to intervene. Equally, there is no obligation on the Leader of the Opposition to give way. Order. Somebody muttered from a sedentary position too long. The Honourable Gentleman is entitled to his opinion. I'm telling the House what the factual position is, however uncomfortable, and that is that the Right Honourable Gentleman is in order. What is not in order is for people to shout and barrack in total violation of what has been set out at the start of our proceedings. And I urge members who may be irritated to behave with dignity. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. No, I'm not going to give way. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker we have no objection to reviewing the franchise with regard to overseas citizens. But I do hope, and I, take the, I hope the Government will take this point seriously, that the Government will be minded not only to looking at those that have lived abroad for several decades, but also to look at 16 and 17 year olds in this country, old enough to marry, old enough to work, old enough to join the army, rightly allowed to vote in the Scottish referendum, but not able to vote in our elections. There is something perverse in a government enfranchising thousands of people who haven't lived in Britain for years when it's disenfranchising hundreds of thousands of British residents through its individual voter registration plan. Which is why, as part of the EU referendum campaign, many of us are spending a lot of time encouraging young people to ensure they are registered to vote. It's their future that is at stake. Everyone in this House, Mr Speaker, understands the risks posed by terrorism. This city, London, has experienced it before, as have other cities around the world. We will, of course, look, we will of course support strong measures to give the police and security the services and resources they need. But we will also support checks and balances to ensure powers are used appropriately. And we would welcome any proposals from the government to reform the prevent strategy and instead to emphasise the value of community-led work to prevent young people being drawn into extremism in any form. 
In foreign, in foreign policy, we must put our promotion of human rights at the centre. We cannot continue to turn a blind eye and worse, sell arms to those countries that abuse human rights either within or beyond their borders. I welcome the forthcoming visit of President Santos of Colombia and I look forward to meeting him to discuss human rights in what is hopefully on its way to becoming a post-conflict society. This government's legislative programme spoke of humanitarian challenges. We are grateful to Lord Dubbs for taking on the challenge of making the government more humanitarian. Just a few weeks previously, Mr Speaker, this Prime Minister was referring to refugees fleeing persecution as a bunch of migrants and a swarm. I have to say this, those words were wrong. I hope the Prime Minister will think again about them and recognise, as everyone should, that refugees are simply human beings just like any of us in this chamber who are trying to survive in a very dangerous and very cruel world. We need to solve their problems with humanity, not with that kind of language. All sides of the House, Mr Speaker, will have been heartened by the increased turnout in the elections for police and crime commissioners, particularly welcome in Cheshire, Gwent, Humberside and Leicestershire. And we welcome any moves that will give them the power to improve accountability of their communities. Our police forces mostly do an excellent job. But, Mr Speaker, the recent Hillsborough inquest and the results of it showed they must never be above scrutiny to ensure they do their jobs properly. We know on this side of the House that decent public services are necessary for a good society, but that they depend on tax revenues. We welcome any measures designed to properly tackle tax avoidance and tax evasion. But this government's record on this subject is one of continuous failure. Just a month ago, the Prime Minister welcomed in this House EU proposals on country-by-country -country tax transparency. But on the 26th of April, Conservative MEPs yet again voted against the same proposals. Didn't they get the memo from the Prime Minister? And that same Prime Minister continues to allow UK tax havens not to issue public registers of beneficial ownership and oppose wholesale the introduction of beneficial ownership registers for offshore trusts. People expect companies that trade in this country and people who live in this country to pay their tax in this country. It funds our public services. Aggressive tax avoidance and tax evasion are an attack on our NHS, on our schools, on care for the elderly and disabled people, on social security and prevent poverty, homelessness and destitution. Mr Speaker, if anyone wants to deliver a more equal society, an economy that works for everyone and a society where there is opportunity for all, it takes an active government to do it not the driverless car heading in the wrong direction that we have in this government at the present time.